it goes like ooh, ooh yeah, yeah And it goes like ooh, ooh yeah, yeah When I press play, all I hear is you ooh. And it goes like ooh, ooh yeah, yeah When I press play, all I hear is you ooh. Oh, every single song tells me we're through ooh, Yeah But I can't turn it off cause it's the truth Yeah, it's the truth And it goes like Hello 
everyone. Uh, I am Usbusi Sodushozi. Welcome to the Art Fluence Human Rights Festival 2023. And I'm super excited to be hosting this uh, session today. It is about uh, strength in the numbers. It's an art collective session. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hopefully today's discussion is going to part a few things into your mind and maybe intrigue you a bit into trying and, you know, doing things differently and doing things that are going to have an impact. Today, we are joined by, in the session, we're joined by some people from The Unusual Bone, which is Kanya and Emily, uh, who are a collective powerhouse. Hi, guys. And I think you can see them on screen right now. And we also have Rowan Smith, who is a multidisciplinary artist and musician. Hello, hello, everyone. If uh, each of you can just say hi to the audience. Hello, hello. Hello. <laughs> nice to have you guys here. And we're going to be talking about social impact and, you know, trying to achieve social impact using a collective, more specifically an artistic collective. Now, I'd just like maybe each of you to just introduce yourselves. Kenya, I'm going to start with you. Uh, just a bit of an intro and then I'm going to move to Emily and then uh, we close off the intros uh, to uh, Rowan Smith. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Kanya Fuyun. I'm a writer and director in both theatre and film, um, and I live and work in Cape Town. Hey, everyone. I'm Emily Bodnors, and um, also a creator and director of film and commercials, and um, uh, live and based and work um, in Cape Town and from Cape Town, and with Kanya, we have the collective called Unusual Bones. Hi, everyone. My name is Rowan. I'm an educator and um, contemporary artist and also a musician. And I'm sort of speaking on behalf of the collective Dead Symbols, um, who's comprised of myself and Wasumzi and Como and Fernando Damon. Thank you so much for those guys. And um, hopefully yeah, the audience is excited because uh, those were such strong intros actually. Now we are looking at social change in this uh, session. We are looking at how social change is rooted in organizing and mobilizing people. You know, when making arts as a collective, how does one collective come to agree on a message and how will they advocate for that campaign? You know, so we're going to be looking at what are some of the benefits artistic collectives have managed to achieve by sharing resources, by sharing space, by sharing ideas with each other. And also what can other artists learn about managing a collective artistic process? Now we're gonna go straight through. Um, we have two videos. One is from uh, Leanne Kurt Botman, who is from uh, the Printing Girls, who's going to be sharing um, you know, her thoughts on this one. My name is Lorene Keen Bodma and I'm a member of The Printing Girls. The Printing Girls is a large collective of over 100 female identifying artists from all over South Africa who work in print. Uh, TPG was initiated by Amy Jane van der Berg in 2016 when she contacted around six of her fellow alumni from Rhodes University. As a large collective, we have structures in place to meet share information and organize exhibition in the form of a website, portal and WhatsApp communities. Within a collective, artists have something at their disposal which is invaluable in our field, and that is peers and soundboards. Artists can challenge one another, develop their conceptual framework and get valuable feedback from one another in the context of the collective where like-minded people come together to work collaboratively. You have the potential to initiate unforeseen projects and you have a soundboard that you can bounce ideas that can later be developed into tangible projects. You have support and a collective voice which can be aimed towards certain areas of interest or a certain goal. In participating, listening, collaborating and engaging with other artists in the space of the collective, um, you can learn skills, techniques, and manage to get your art showcased in spaces you previously thought inaccessible. To anyone who wishes to work collaboratively and start a collective, I have um, three points of advice. And the first one is 
to make sure you share a common goal or purpose. The second one is a collective does not have to be a large group of artists working together. A collective can be small, such as two or three artists working closely together. And number three, do not be confined by what you think a, a collective is supposed to be. Uh, let the collaborative effort and engagement with one another guide you in identifying your goals and your identity as a collective. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to the printing course for that one. And I think uh, she mentioned something that is very important when it comes to turning ideas into tangible projects. You know, sometimes as I know, you know, sometimes art can have this thing of wanting to just be an idea and not something that is, um, you know, put out there. Uh, so I think the very important thing, you know, when you have a collective, when you know you have people supporting you, it's easy to execute uh, you know which is sometimes quite a number of us actually get stuck there uh, you know so but to get we're going to move on to the second video before we get into our discussion with my panelists right here uh, which is from the kuti collective I like you know the difference between our two videos one is kind of uh, a collective that is based online and then the other one actually has a physical space and how you know they were putting that space together as a collective it's something amazing to witness now i'm gonna take it to our panelists just to describe your collective guys like why uh, did you start a collective you know what is the vision or what is the end goal of the collective and actually how did you find each other you know, because it's very hard to actually find people who have that the same idea and who want to see the same thing and have the same vision. So I'm just going to let uh, maybe Kenya and Emily start, and then we're going to go to um, um, Rowan. Cool. Um, I'm going to kick us off, and I think Em's going <laughs> to jump in. Um, mm -hmm. So essentially, I think it's a good place to start where we found one another. So Emily and I both grew up in the Strand, Somerset West area of um, the Western Cape, uh, which is one of the uh, smaller sort of suburbs before you get to Cape Town. Um, and we ended up in high school together and sort of <laughs> at the very young age of 13, both of us were crazy enough to want to do a bunch of artistic things. Um, and I think it was just sort of two very kindred spirits that found one another um, in the suburbs. <laughs> and um, so since then, we've actually been tackling things and doing it together. And then both of us eventually ended up studying at UCT, um, both studied theater and performance. and once both of us graduated, the conversation sort of very organically came up that we keep one, making work together and maybe we should start and formulate it as a collective. Um, and that's essentially how Unusual Bones was born. We sort of um, both started working in the industry quite quickly after we graduated. Um, Emily a bit more in the film industry originally, I worked more in the theatre industry originally and both of us sort of 
started to see that the the industry um, ways of working sometimes has an extremely hierarchical approach and a and an extremely mm-hmm. masculine approach to it and it was something both of us were quite keen to actively challenge and start imagining alternative ways to work in film and theater that has a way more collaborative approach and so unusual bones is essentially um a group in which um creatives with like-minded ideas can come and seek to explore alternative and interdisciplinary ways of working um and we really want to continuously create projects that seek to challenge and question the sort of South African landscape and the cultures around us. And so that's essentially how the collective was born and what the sort of vision and mission is. I don't know, Em, maybe? Yeah, you can... no, that's pretty much it. The good, <laughs> good sum up of it in a nutshell. <laughs> wow, that is actually very beautiful. Uh, so you guys go way back, actually. Um, yes, yeah. we've actually... seen each other for all the awkward phases. <laughs> <laughs> that is the, uh, that is very beautiful. I think that's also could be one of the things that just could make you know your collective very successful. I know you guys you guys have done um, award winning projects actually, and I think it actually makes sense now that you um, you know uh, say Wuti that you started way back in high school being together, and then from university after graduating, actually you guys were like actually. You know, let's collaborate in this thing. And I like how you're also challenging, you know, structures that are put in place that are hindering progress, actually. And that is what mm-hmm. we are looking for and what what we're talking about actually today, you know, making a social impact through an arts collective. That is very beautiful. Now, Rowan Smith mm-hmm. from Dead Symbols, uh, if you could just, uh, you know, give your share of um, you, explaining your collective, which is Dead Symbols, and, you know, why, how did you guys meet and what is the end goal uh, that you're trying to achieve? Um, Rowan, I think you muted. Got it. Um, so all three of us have quite sort of active independent practices and we had sort of cross paths in the Cape Town creative scene in various different ways. Um, and we actually came together quite serendipitously during COVID um, in the very beginning. Um, you know, Fernando was aware of my sort of interest in, in sort of experimental sound practice. And we actually bumped into each other in the queue in checkers and he said, hey, I've got this idea for this project. I want to bounce some ideas around you with you and just to see if, if anything comes from it. And it just happened that at the same time I was working um, with Wussy in a, in a pedagogical context, developing a curriculum for a tertiary institution that centered around um, black radicalism. And that was called, I think we ended up calling it Posts and um, I can't remember the title of the course. It will come to me in a second. Uh, Post and Anthropologies of, of Black Studies. Um, so we were looking at um, acad- that academic theory and developing the syllabus for um, for um, the tertiary institution. And we have a, a lot of our collaboration is structured um, around academic theory and our relationship, actually. Um, and so it just kind of came through the sort of confluences and meeting intersections of that, those those. Sort of events and we just came together during the early days of COVID and one of the um, big determining factors because um, I um, work with the um, commercial gallery What If The World and at the time um, all the commercial galleries had closed so they were just sitting empty and so I asked my gallery to use the gallery as a performance space um, to just start messing around and that very early image and that, that, that having the gallery as the backdrop has been kind of one of our um, interests and antagonisms as a collective. So to, to look at the limits and differences between the sort of the stage and the concert hall and the gallery space, because that brings with it a whole different, um, I don't know, let's call it a contractual engagement with your audience. The audience arrives with different expectations to those different spaces. Um, so that was quite important formatively. And we've continued to play in between those spaces when we, um, when we do um, produce live events. Um, and yeah, as far as our end goal, I mean, I think it's constantly evolving, but um, I mean, we're, I guess we're interested in the potential, um, what can come out of the potential intersections between academic theory and experimental music and, and you know, straddling both the, 
the gallery sphere and the, the sort of parallel cultural cultural spheres of arts and music and how they intersect and don't in different places. Mm, yeah. mm, mm. Thank you so much, Rowan. I like that. I like that very much. I like that um, also that we are here and there are different ways that you both of yours collectives actually came together. You know, Rowan's magician, Uguti, one of them, they met um, at Checkers, you know, the Q and Checkers, you know, and that's that's like one thing I like about, you know, art and, you know, creatives amongst each other. It's like you can sense each other that you guys, you and me are uh, sort of like in the same community, um, you know, and I like how just different people from different walks of life can just come together and challenge a norm and actually want to experiment as well, you know, explore things that, you know, haven't really been explored as well. I think that is very beautiful. And both of these collectives that I have here today, um, they have achieved a lot and they've, you know, done a lot actually. I think maybe with you, Rowan, um, started from COVID and then wanting to explore at, you know, some arts museum as well with your collective. What are some of the rewards would you say um, have been brought in by, you know, starting a collective and by being in a collective? I mean, I think dead symbols is completely contingent on the sort of relational chemistry between the three of us. It wouldn't exist if one of us left and it wouldn't exist with, it's just, there's a, the personality, um, I mean, whatever you want to call it, um, the, the, how well we get along is really at the crux of how well the, the project works. Um, yeah. And we're both, and we're, we're sort of quite aware of our different roles. And I think that's very important about coll in a, a collective is not to expect everyone to be doing the same thing or to be doing what you're doing is to like really acknowledge that you bring different strengths to the project and to let people, mm -hmm. you know, occupy those spaces in their roles and, and bring their, you know, occupy within their, their, their strengths. Um, and then also, um, I mean, as a, as a sonic practice, it's almost, it's sort of, by, by virtue of the medium, it's you can do a lot more with more people. So, where mm -hmm. you know I come from a, a, a sort of sculpture background and a fine art background, and you know a painter doesn't necessarily need a whole lot of people to execute a painting, although sometimes they do. But to be on stage to make a lot of sounds at once, to um, you need more than one person. So in some ways, the medium was also detect, like dictating the collectiveness of the of our, of our group, I guess. Oh yeah, I that is just more. <laughs> Yeah, that is definitely very beautiful. And I like that you mentioned, you know, understanding each other's, you know, roles that we play in the collective, because we're seeing quite a number of, you know, jewels, and especially in music, quite a number of jewels, quite a number of groups that they, they, they make it, you know, you know, they get more famous, and then you, the next thing they dissolve or they break up. Sometimes the breakup is consensual. Sometimes it's just very bad, um, you know, but I think you mentioned quite important parts there uh, into, you know, understanding each other's role. Maybe if, um, you know, Kanya, uh, you can expand on how to really keep a collective going and some of the benefits of having a collective going. Uh, sorry, I was just activating my mic there. Um, I think um, for us in terms of like um, now having kind of worked with each other for such a long time, especially under the the, the flag or the umbrella of Unusual Bones, um, one of the most beautiful things in that space has been the fact that we are able to learn so much from each other because yes we are both creatives and yes we are both collaborators and have the same idea and intention um we both are so different in our ways uh, and our abilities and our knowledge even until today we, we we still growing so much in different ways and it's so exciting every time we come together for a new project that we are able to not just collaborate together but also learn from each other um mm. And, and I think that's that's an exciting part of that that keeps a collective I think healthy all the time is that you constantly um, acknowledge what the people around you in the collective are also bringing to the table and learn from that um, and never and never think that or never arrive at a place where you think that you know how it is to create something or to move something forward. So that's something that's that's really um, been um, incredible. And then something that kind of stems out from that is also then the 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 gift of being able to use each other so for example if 
um, for a certain project. And I think that's also kind of our mindset and intention around creating such a collaborative space is to be able to almost operate like a, a constant um, body of, of creatives at, to, to whoever is creating the current project's disposal. So for example, if Kanya is creating a project for a theater production that is going to a festival and um, this is just like a very plain example and um, she needs to design a poster of sorts um, that she's able to um, tap into that kind of talent of mine and I'm able to create something like that for her or if I am busy uh, doing a proposal for something and I need Kanya's writing expertise on a certain level, I'm able to tap into that pool and and there's this constant creative and free giving and collaboration which i think is is what's really amazing of a kind of a space like this um did that did that kind of answer your question yeah definitely definitely you know you're tapping into each other's different strengths actually and yeah. being able to learn from each other as well you know one of your weaknesses now becoming a strength because you're learning from the other person um you know i think maybe if kenya um, could just touch on that one in terms of, you know, learning from each other and being able to achieve the work that um, you achieve, maybe highlighting also what you've achieved as a collective. Yes. Cool. Uh, yeah, I was gonna, I was just gonna uh, jump in there because I think, I think as young creatives, it's so easy. Um, sorry, I'm gonna answer the question in two seconds, but I, I think as young creatives, specifically in a country that necessarily doesn't necessarily always have the resources to support creatives. Mm -hmm. It's so easy to fall under a narrative that there's not enough or that mm -hmm. every single person is your competitor. Um, and it's really interesting if you start flipping that narrative around where you go, any win for a peer of mine is a win for me. Um, mm -hmm. And I think Emily and I very consciously sort of are each other's biggest cheerleaders because the, the concept is essentially whatever Emily wins, I gain by, and whatever I win, I gain by, and every opportunity is an opportunity for us all. Um, mm. And I think that's maybe a really interesting thing young collaborators need to be aware of, is that there is this narrative of there's not enough space for all the artists, or there's not enough work for all the artists, or there's not enough funding for all the artists. But the truth is we can pull each other up into those spaces. Um, mm. And so I think that's essentially what M and I have very consciously been doing. So we've been working in a in a wide range of fields. Um, we actively sort of make uh, short films and films, but so too we we have a deep love for a live performance and performance art. Um, and so. It's exactly what Emily says, where the one strength sort of, and it's what Rowan is also saying, it's that thing of knowing who's, whose strengths play to which aspect of what project. Um, yeah. And in some way you make your life much easier <laughs> by allowing someone to do what they're good at doing um, and not seeing it as a threat or a, a, a sort of a threat to you, but to seeing it as, as how, as a gain. Um, mm. And I really don't think Emily and I would have done half of the projects we've done and won half of the sort of awards if it wasn't for the fact that we really actively try to um, practice championing one another and the strengths we have. That is definitely very beautiful. I think uh, those are some of the very important pointers if there is someone out there who wants to start a collective or maybe someone out there who thinks they don't have enough resources. Here's the solution, a collective, you know? And I, I, I like the mention of um, as well that you also learn from each other and a win for you is also a win for Emily and a win for Emily is also a win for you and I think that's you know the grasp also the purpose of um, a collective maybe Rowan if you could share with us some of the projects that you know um, 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 your collective has actually done and has made and maybe how can you you know we find um, such um, 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 projects as well Yes, sure. Um, we sort of started off um, just releasing albums digitally 
I mean, call them albums or projects or suites, however you want to frame it. I'm on Bandcamp, so you can just, if you just search Dead Symbols in Bandcamp, you'll mm. find that discography. I, I think I think there's five albums there since 2020. Um, and then we had our first, and then we, um, and together with that, alongside that, we had our first live performance. Um, the beginning of last or in February last year in, in a space called Wolf Space, which was a Bree Street, which has since closed, but it was a rooftop space. And there was um, we were part of a, a, um, a sort of event that was structured around Afrofuturism and sound and looking at sonic futures and um, that sort of body of theory. And then we had what was quite an important event for us as a band was at um, there's a, a project space, an arts. Also, an art, another artist collective started a project space called Under Projects in Ruland Street um, in Cape Town, which is also just you know self-motivated, completely independently um, funded and run um, group of I think four artists. Um, and in the very early stages, I happened to share a studio with one of the artists, and I just pitched that did symbols do something in their project space, you know, not really having a very clear idea. But we had a we had a two day um, I guess, I don't know what you call it, um, live performance that was five hours a day at under projects, you know, like not quite knowing what would happen. And we sort of, um, it was quite an important turning point in, sort of in defining what we do as a band and what we can do and the sort of limits we were interested in pushing. Um, but yeah, we occupied that project space for, for, for five hours a day and then also released a recording of that. Um, and we're also lucky to have other musicians come into the space. So it wasn't just a performance space. Um, there were, we had talks um, like Tumi Mokoroso was also performing at Chimarenga the same weekend. So he just swung by and we had this like fantastic conversation and we structured it mm. because it was in a gallery space and not on a, in a, on a stage or in a concert, we could play with, you know, the relationship between the performer and the audience. So we ended up just playing a little bit and then stopping and taking a break and chatting with everyone and then playing again. And, you know, the viewers didn't have necessarily have to sit through this like one hour event. It was, they could pop in and then come back. And, you know, it's, you know, there was moments where the sound was really loud and moments when it was really ambient. And, you know, so it allowed for us for a lot of, um, you know, exploration in terms of what we could do as a collective in that sort of context. And then now we're sort of working towards our next performance for this year, which hopefully will be at Chimarenga in July this year. But we'll see. We're still figuring out the details. Wow, that is that is very beautiful. It seems like you've actually achieved a lot since uh, 2020 um, lockdown years, um, you know, which was very hectic, um, especially for artists. So it's actually quite um quite a lot that you've achieved uh, considering how hectic you know the scene the scenes were for artists mm. during covid um you know so i think that's actually something that is very important and, and you mentioned how you now um have studio sessions you know studio sessions with um you know another collective and it brings to me the question of you know how right now we seeing quite a number of musicians, you know, complaining about uh, being in their record labels and being played by their record labels. Um, you know, do you think a collective could combat that, um, you know, that scene where people feel trapped in their um, 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 record labels? And I think quite recently, actually, one of our um, hit makers, Google to hit makers, uh, Prince KB, uh, mentioned how he is still unsure of whether um, he's going to be creating more music because there's still that thing of he doesn't own the music that he's made and mm. that quite hits hard, um, you know, from from uh, especially from an artist who's poured their hearts out f to their art. So do you think really a collective could sort of come back to that? Because people sometimes complain about resources. This is why I joined the label because I want, mm. you know, a studio session. I want my um music to be streamed i want my films to be on yeah. tv you know this is why so do you think a collective could actually come back to that and maybe uh, elaborate on that one mm, i mean i think that's a really interesting question and you know probably could do a whole discussion just on that question but yeah. but yes uh, collectively coming together and pooling resources and um you know using each other's strengths and the strengths of the community uh, you know that supports you around you is definitely one of the ways that you can sort of 
uh, you know, maintain a sense of autonomy and creative control. Um, but I always, I think it is a hard balance, you know, between having the, I don't know, the financial supports, you know, that an institution like a record label or a commercial gallery might offer, um, you know, mm -hmm. versus working outside of that in the, in the sort of margins of project spaces and independently and, you know, like getting things together. Yeah. As, as in whatever, in whatever capacity you can. Um, um, and I think, yeah, I mean, I think it's, a, it's, I guess at the end of the day, it's up to the artists collected what their idea of success is, but um, for us mm -hmm. as a collective, it's, not, it's like working against those institutions and, 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 um, pushing against them and, and seeing how much we can make um, as, as an independent collective. Oh, definitely. Um, Emily, your thoughts maybe on that one? I think it's really um, interesting what Rowan was just saying, because um, I often find that as, as a collective that follows a kind of um, structural strategy that is, is if you want to call it slightly like a different path than kind of your commercial creating kind of um, processes etc cetera, etc cetera. um and and especially when it comes to the topics and the artwork and the whatever it is that you are creating and talking about it's so easily to uh, it's so easy to kind of almost immerse yourself so deeply into that world and mm. almost lose the point of um not relatability but kind of like mass um communication if, if you want to call it that. And I, I find it so interesting how how that line between kind of like creating, making sure you go down kind of a creative path that feels original and organic, but still keeping in mind this kind of thing of um, um, being able to speak to a quite a broad audience, if, if that is the intention of the project, obviously. I find that balance quite interesting. Um, you know, especially I, I recently spoke to a cinematographer who asked me kind of like, you know, what would your ultimate next kind of feature film be? Um, and I kind of explained to her a little bit about the genre and this and that and this and that. And she was kind of like, but for mass audience, right? Not, not like a, not like a, a like a art film. And I was like, no, an art film, but for the mass audience. <laughs> so, yeah. So I, I find that balance really interesting, um, and 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 also the monetizing of kind of mm. the, the work that we're doing, um, and yeah. how and how to make sure that you do enough kind of like things to sustain yourself in these spaces, but also not mm. sell your soul. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, you mentioned something that is very important, actually, um, which brings my next question, maybe um, starting with Kanya, uh, that do you think maybe a collective has helped um, you reach further, much more communities? Because what Emily is mentioning, I've actually experienced with quite a number of artists where I'm enjoying the art, but once the person goes mainstream, it's like they change and you're like, I'm not recognizing you anymore. I'm not recognizing the art that you're making anymore. Um, you know, it's sort of like the person has fallen to fallen into the desperation of appealing to a mass audience. And there's also artists who, you know, even when they have mass audiences, they're still able to keep what they were doing. They're still able to keep their authenticity, if I may put it like that. So I think maybe Kanya, if you could expand on, you know, and an, a collective being. Um, able to reach a community or more communities um, rather than just being faced with trying to tackle a community alone and having the thoughts of maybe selling your soul even just to reach a, 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 a further audience. Absolutely. It's so interesting because I think, I think the one perk of working in collectives is that, make no mistake, your collective will also be your harshest critic like mm -hmm. <laughs> your collective will be the one that reminds you of the sort of vision and mission <laughs> very quickly. Yeah. Um, and I think that's great. I think why not be in partnerships that's going to, you know, at moments where you're not sure if this fits into the sort of work or ethics you want to work in. Uh, like I can think of a couple of times where Emily's gone to me, Kanya, this is not the project to take on. We're not doing this. We're not going to, we're not going to bend on this sort of 
this is the mm. one thing we said we wouldn't do. And and looking back, I, I'm very grateful for those moments because it's these moments in which we quite harshly remind each other of what our vision and mission is and sort of remind ourselves of the voice we have or the voice we're trying to maintain. Um, and I think in that in that sense, a collective is a, is a beautiful gift in keeping you sort of on a path that tries to stay honest to a larger group because you can't mm -hmm. just look after yourself. There's mm -hmm. multiple people in that moment that needs to be considered. Um, but so too, the beauty of a collective, I do think is the fact that it does open communities far quicker um, because mm -hmm. if your sense is that you want to work with an openness and with this, a sense of inviting in, um, once again, it, it's wonderful in these collective moments where both of us can push each other to go, well, have we really looked at a wider community? Have we really asked every single person we can think of? Um, and that's because I think, once again, it, creating is tricky. And I, I get why people keep working with the same people because there's a safety in starting to understand someone's language or style. Mm -hmm. Um, and then there's a really great gift in someone going, we said we're going to open spaces, so let's open. We don't know this person, but let's open the door. Um, and so I really I really think a collective can be a great way, if you're going to stay honest with one another, a collective mm -hmm. can be a great way in maintaining an authentic voice, even with the rush of <laughs> capital and rent and, yeah. and trying mm -hmm. to yeah definitely definitely i think that is very beautiful and you mentioned uh, you know something that is very important there how a collective also provides a safe space uh for artists and i think that is why in as much as i like art and i love art but i just love artists way more because of how i think exposing it is to make something and you know having that courage to create um you know is, is really is really really amazing and it seems like we have a question from our facebook live and it is from yusra and she is asking does the collective help you push your art to a level of excellence maybe a level beyond what you thought is possible or is it easier to achieve a level of excellence on your own? What a what a beautiful question uh, there from Yusra. Thank you so much, Yusra. I'm not sure if uh, maybe Rowan, you'd like to start? Yes, sure. Um, thanks for the question, Yusra. Um, yes, definitely. I mean, we're constantly, as um, um, Kanya mentioned already, that constant that your your collective is definitely your harshest critic, and we're constantly pushing each other, and um, mm -hmm. in ways that you would never under necessarily understand by yourself. So to have multiple perspectives is yes. The answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is yes, and I think uh, Kanya uh, touched on it a bit as well. I'm not sure if you'd like to expand. There's something that I wanted to mention, Kanya Valle. Yeah, no, um, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, there was something actually when I read that question, 120%, I feel like I'm th just thinking back to the first short film that Kanya and I created called Ecstasis. And I mean, we were super kind of ambitious and we were like, let's just make a film. We didn't know anything about how this is supposed to happen, how to mm -hmm. do this, what we're doing. But in the creation or in the process of creation, there were, point, there were moments and points where because we work together as two equals in a create in a in a creative space like creating and writing a film and directing it um something very interesting happens that you start to and and, and you have to almost check in with yourself quite um and, and and with your your creative partner in quite an honest way but you start to see things that the other person is contributing that you're like wow i don't know that like mm -hmm. wow that's like like what if that person didn't now contribute this to this process then we wouldn't have arrived at this amazing place, whether it be an aesthetic choice, a performance moment, a whatever it might might have been. But you almost constantly reminded of how much you can still learn and mm. how much you still have to grow. And I think that's the most beautiful part. And that's when you start to appreciate how much further the work that you then create with your creative partner is 
is is more or closer to a point of if we're calling it like excellence than mm. what you could have done on your own um but it is a process in which you have to really be able and con and, and comfortable to humble yourself um yeah. you co- I, I, like, yeah, yeah. Th- that's an interesting one for me it is i i was about to say as well i think i think there's there's this illusion that i was chatting to someone the other day as well and we were talking about how a, a, a collaboration is quite a buzzword currently <laughs> like yeah, it's yeah. great to collaborate mm. but it's very difficult like mm. a, a creative impulse is inherently something that's quite an individual experience of the world mm. um and so it's it's tricky it's tr- <laughs> it's tricky to um try and bring you know and i think sometimes strong artists are very stubborn artists both emily and i can be ex- extremely stubborn <laughs> about yeah. what we think the right approach is mm. um, and i think that's part of what makes us who we are and so it's difficult to bring two very stubborn or three very stubborn <laughs> gut feelings onto the mm. same page and so but i think it is in that challenge and it's in going let's put the work first so the sort of ego has to step aside for a second and you need to ask yourself what's going to really serve the work um mm. and it's that push it's that sort of uncomfortable space where you are battling with your own ego but also the the belief you have in a project where i think the true sort of magic happens where it goes beyond what you could have done by yourself mm. um is that moment where it's uncomfortable and it's sometimes you're going to lose and sometimes it's not your idea and sometimes you yeah. go around and around and around but then something quite magical happens where it becomes something you could have exactly what Emily was saying you you couldn't have gotten there by yourself um, mm, i think yeah thank you so much uh, kanya i think you mentioned um something for my next question actually which is now you know we've mentioned you know all the greats um of a collective and how it can you know enhance um creative excellence as well but it's not always that ideas are going to flow the same we are all going to agree with the same idea we're always going to just say oh yes that is perfect i think we should do it and someone is adding to that there's 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 sort of bound to have you know that conflict and i just like to know how do you then navigate that um space where you guys are not agreeing on a certain thing that you feel strongly about especially i'm talking to the people now who are here on the panel and uh if um you know um especially for dead symbols if one of you maybe some of you guys are joining here and and listening to this i'd just like to know how you specifically roll and deal with um you know an idea that you feel strongly about but you know other guys are like nah, i think <laughs> i think we should go this route No absolutely that's also, it's an interesting question and and um Kanye mentioned the ego and that is you know something that's very prevalent in in an artist's practice no matter where when what sphere you're practicing in you, you are mm. giving a part of yourself to the world that is inherently part of your ego so in many ways like the collective identity like sort of softens that ego a little bit because well it does for our band i think um it's becomes less important and the collective sort of um i don't know the collective intention and the the sort of discourse between each other becomes more important than than our like individual egos um so i think like wrestling with um ideas is part of our practice so i think that's it's like it it's part of our process so i think that's great i mean we argue all the time and we also support each other so encouraging and so supportive of each other but um i, I do think No, I'll leave it there. That's fine. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. I like I like that actually mentioning that you know conflict is part of the process. It's part of what creates um you know the beauty and uh, I think I'd just like to know from Emily how do you deal with Kanye when she really believes in an idea and you just don't think it's going to work? I am agree. <laughs> <laughs> um I mean, I think I think and 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 Kanye jump in whenever you want. I think um Rowan what you were saying now about how it's such an integral part of the process and I just want to second that and and I think what 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 kind of two things I want to mention is like how do we navigate it is one we'll get onto in a moment but firstly mm. just 
what I think is so good about this conflict is yeah. Kanya and I will sit in the editing suite and we'll be looking, we'll sitting with the editor and Kanya will go, this is the shot. And I'll go, no, this is the shot. No, no, no. This is the shot because da da da. No, this is the shot because da da. Then we actually start formulating our arguments around why and and we mm. want to choose this particular shot or creative approach or whatever it may be. And by doing that, you delve, you you kind of you remind yourself of what the intention is with what you're creating. Mm. So you remind yourself, okay, well, what is it we're trying to get out of the scene that this person is being uh, manipulated by something and if we need to make this something or whatever clear so you actually practice your kind of you, your um you practice your kind of argument your arguments are kind of like a pra form of practice for your in the greater intention of each project which i think is really really great um and i think that's kind of how we approach each one of those and and sometimes it takes us a moment to like i mean it, it, it also interestingly like it, it very seldom happens like we're really weirdly creatively in tuned so we're really mm -hmm. blessed to be, to be to have one another in this space you know mm -hmm. but obviously we're human and obviously we do be different individuals so it does happen and i think we we often and i think this is something that i value very much about our relationship in this space is we have debriefs so often you have these creative uh, intensive discussions sometimes in a very intensive moment like on set in the process of creation of something where there's no time to faff about it. There's no time to really have a long argument or conversation about it. You have to kind of make a choice. And then we would always, after a project, after a conversation like this, have a debrief and go, okay, how did this moment make you feel? I actually thought like the, you came across quite um, like this or that. And I think like your idea was really great here. I'm so sorry because I didn't, um, I wasn't listening. I was stressed in that moment. And we'll always make sure we have debriefs after any um, process. I think mm -hmm. there's a, um, any kind of, whether we're making a film or whether we are pitching for something, whatever, we will always check in and to go, these are the things I felt. These are the things I want to get off my chest that I want to apologize for, that I want to say like that. I love the way that you did this. And I think mm. that's a really something that we've been trying to do after each one. That's a really healthy kind of, um, uh, what do you want to call it? Like just a, uh, approach. Yeah. 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 Approach. Yeah. I, I really like that. I really like that a lot, you know, a debrief session because you, you, if, if I, I'm guessing if you would, if you wouldn't have that, you know, people would walk away with their egos bruised and, you know, would come back with that anger, um, you know, and, and mm. the funny thing about anger is that it, it just stays in the system. And as much as you might think that, Oh, I'm fine. I'm over it, but it's just going to, if it's not expressed, especially, it's just going to, you know, come out in different ways. And I think it, a debrief is actually very important. Now on to my next question. I think, um, you know, we are touching now on, uh, you know, relationships, especially. And um, um, my question then is, do you think, you know, being friends or having a much more um, intimate relationship with someone who's in the collective makes the collective better or it's it, it's the same and people who don't know each other can still make it work as long as they have you know some nitty-gritties and maybe expand on those nitty-gritties what it is and what can keep a collective going in as in as much as you guys are not friends um maybe you've just met um you know i think um, how how do we navigate to that space where it's 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 more of a professional meeting or it's more of a professional uh, collective rather than um, you know two people who know each other meeting and actually um, you know working together. I'm not sure if Rowan would like to start. I think um, since uh, he's a, one of the people they met at Checkers, they didn't know each other. Uh, you know, how has that relationship unfolded? You know, no, I think um, I think becoming friends um, was quite important to our collective, and I think there are different kinds of collectives, and I think um, some collectives can operate, you know, in that kind of where friendship is not necessarily a necessity, but. Um, it's definitely part of our process and we've increasingly become friends and our practice extends you know after a gig or after practice to dinner to lunches to mm -hmm. whatever to uh, to you know reading sessions or listening sessions so there's a whole sort of 
sphere that comes part of that that also contributes to the process of our making as well so for mm -hmm. us i think it's it is important that we are friends in this particular collective but i'm I can imagine models where it's not necessarily imperative um yeah and in terms of in terms of maintaining it i mean i think that's quite a difficult can be quite a difficult one to maintain a collective because because it's comprised of these individual people that all have you know they all whole you know matrixes of practices and families and plans and could end up anywhere mm -hmm. uh, you know in another city at any other time you know, and um, the band might not be enough of a reason to for that person to stay there. So I think there's a is a precariousness that's inherent to to collectives. Um, and um, yeah, I think I think I think that sometimes collectives, um, it's also about recognizing that they only are a temporary structure, and then that they need to exist just for that moment in time because of the constraints and the intersections of people mm. and personalities and whatever's happening culturally in that locality. And then when those conditions are no longer, you know, sustainable, then to, to actually let it go and to allow something else to, to take that, that in its place. But having said that, um, we definitely intend in symbols to be a very long-term project. So I hope neither of them end up moving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 thank you so much for that rowan and actually you know touching on my last question but before i go into it maybe kanya if you could expand on do does a collective really need to be you know people who get along and people who maybe are friends and maybe share the same experiences even yo there was a lot of questions in there <laughs> I don't think you have to share the same experiences. I think if anything, it's quite interesting sometimes when you have different experiences and you're, but I do think it's important that you, it's quite interesting, both Rowan and Emily kept returning back to the word intention. And I think that mm -hmm. is the important thing. I think mm -hmm. if the intention is sort of um, clear and the intention is shared, a lot can happen. Um, and I hope, I hope that can happen even outside of friendship. If the intention, I think Emily and I've worked with a with a bunch of people that aren't necessarily our closest friends, um, but the, because we are so clear about the intention and and we <laughs> we get the buy in from another creative, going this is what we want to do. Are you with us in this? Um, the work sort of can flow from there quite organically, and I think yeah, I think M jump in if I'm. But I think if anything, Em and I had to learn to sort of sometimes be able to split the friendship a bit from the work. Mm, <laughs> Otherwise, mm. you lose the friendship a bit because there's always something to chat about mm. for the work. Um, so we sometimes really make a point to go, okay, this is a friendship coffee. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and so that's been a really healthy model for us where sometimes it's really important to split the two things for us. Mm. Um, but I agree with Rowan, there's something about working with someone who, who in, yeah, who inherently sort of is rooting for you and who has a shared vision in front of you that really feeds the process quite organically. Like Emily and I are continuously WhatsApping each other and in between the friendship chats, there's things like, did you see this call? Did you see this funding cycle? Mm, um, yeah. And so it, it's quite an organic process, partly because we're not putting too much pressure on it to be anything but what we want to make it, um, that which is, I really appreciate. Mm, that is beautiful. Thank you so much, Kanye. Now, on to my last question real quickly, if just maybe under 30 seconds each. Um, we've seen, obviously, I, I did mention and uh, Rowan mentioning that, uh, you know, sometimes things get along the way. Maybe people have, you know, different visions at the end and, you know, a collective ends up dissolving. I'd just like to know from each of you, do you see um, your collective dissolving? Um, do you see it, you know, not, no longer existing um, for whatever reason, maybe if you could share that reason with us? And if no, how are you ensuring that it does not come to that point? I think Emily could start for us there. Yeah, um, I think um, the answer is definitely not. <laughs> um, I think um, both Kanya and my intention and vision and mission for and so deeply aligned um and it's 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 the idea is almost bigger than ourselves for what we want to do with the company and i think that's what will always make it 
keep on going because we're always striving for something that that um feels like we it almost feels like oh my gosh will we get there and we were we're constantly trying and i think that in combination with always making sure we work with people that are keen on each idea and also on our mission and vision keeps us refreshed um mm. and and that's what i think will will also aid to the to unusual bones staying alive and and maintaining a healthy momentum thank you so much rowan um yeah just very quickly um yeah we, i definitely i think we envisage this as a long term project and i think it's important to, for, for us in this in our particular context and how we all three of us also have very active independent practices is that it's okay for the project to come in and out of focus and that by that what i mean is to how much energy it takes you can it doesn't always have to take all of your energy you can be with other together with other things and the project can keep happening in the background and then you can read become together and revisit it a couple of months later so it's sort of always it's something that just it's held together i don't know i, I get by like our the projects and by the collective sort of intention again <laughs> um to borrow emily um so so yeah wow thank you so much for that i'm not sure kanya if you would like to add anything no okay. very happily echoing i think it's it's <laughs> a, a very long 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 term dream Yeah, wow. Thank you so much guys and I think we've come to an end of our beautiful beautiful session. Uh we still have a few minutes left maybe if you have maybe a special message or something upcoming an event that you'd like to share with us we have just under 4 minutes maybe if any of you would like to share anything uh that is upcoming maybe if someone from the audience has a question maybe we can squeeze it in in the last 2 minutes but i think this is your time to share um any upcoming um events any upcoming projects that we might want to look forward to Uh, you guys go, go ahead Kadia. <laughs> I can throw one for unusual bones. Um August this year we're not allowed to disclose just yet, but August mm -hmm. this year a new short will be out um that we're very much excited to share with South Africa. So yes. Keep our socials. Keep your eyes on our socials. <laughs> uh, I think if we could also share your socials as well I think that would be very helpful. Cool. And please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's at unusual. Is there underscore? I'm checking. <laughs> at unusual bones. At unusual bones. I think if someone searches unusual bones, they will definitely it should pop find up. It should pop up. Yeah. And then uh, Rowan. Um, yeah. So we're working towards a um, sort of more substantial live performance in either July or August at hopefully at Chimaringa uh, but it's not confirmed yet but yes also our social media pages will have that information and then we're also working towards um hopefully doing a residency as a band at the probably at the Myrox Foundation in Johannesburg so and that would also towards the end of the year and that would also come with a number of live performances in that part of the country which we we'll look forward to That is very exciting and also um social media where can we find you Rowan? Oh at at dead symbols I'm not sure if there are any underscores or anything. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I like that we also we all aren't sure whether there are underscores. The underscores. <laughs> could be could be could be tricky. Hey, it could be tricky because you would write dead symbols and they say that symbols already exist and you're like, "Hey, I've never heard of any, you know, and so I think that's very beautiful, man. Uh, guys, thank you so much. Uh, this has been beautiful. Hopefully, um, other people have learned as well how to start, how to keep a collective going, and how to deal with conflict as well. I think we've discussed quite a lot of things here. Um, you know, the importance of a collective and how it can actually push your art level to, um, you know, a level of excellence. Actually, how sharing ideas. and such things I, i think we've learned so much from uh, all of you and all the best with the work that you guys do and looking forward to um your work and i'm sure other people are now now know what unusual bones is and you know dead symbols who who mm -hmm. are they and what they do and you know they're now looking forward to your next projects and 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 the like so thank you so much guys um have a great thank evening you. and the arts um, um collective or rather 
Um, the Artfluence campaign still goes on. The Artfluence Festival is still going on. You can catch us again. Um, I think on Monday we're back. On Tuesday we're back again. It's going to be a lot of discussions as well, um, you know, such as this one where you learn a lot. So thank you so much. Um, let's stay tuned to the Artfluence Festival. Thanks. Thanks so much, Lucia.